Hello everyone, it's Larry Clark with Excelsior Music Publishing doing another Meet the Composer session with composer Russell Robinson. Hi Russ, thanks for joining hey, us today. Hey Larry, glad to do it, glad to see you. Well, we're excited to have you on here and talk to students and teachers about your music and your process and stuff like that. So um, maybe give us a brief background of how you got into all this uh, stuff of writing music. I know you've been doing it for a long time, but it'd be interesting for them to know you know how you got started well i can't remember a time that i wasn't writing music you know <laughs> when i was a kid and you know playing trumpet and guitar and piano and then through high school and in college and you know in college as a music ed major uh we had a pretty pretty cool rock band that had horns we did blood sweat and tears in chicago and all that stuff and so we were writing out charts and then we were doing some original things and then I finished my music ed degree and started teaching public school in 74. And uh, the second year, the principal says, you know, this, uh, these other schools have a, we called them swing choirs back then. And I said, he says, we got to have one. And I said, okay. So I did some writing for them. Then I went from there to Miami to get my master's degree in 79, 80, and then back to Cassville, 80, 81, and then doctorate in 81 through 84. And, so I was writing choral arrangements and, you know, all sorts of things and uh, uh, never, never did really band arrangements. Uh, kind of scares me. I tell people all I have to do is, uh, is about four voices and they, somebody said, well, that's three more than you, or two, one more than you do write in a band score. But I think that's an inside joke. But, uh, <laughs> and then I, you know, was teaching school pretty hard uh, starting at the university after my doctorate in 84 and so I had a group here for nine years and um, but when it came writing for publication you know I, I couldn't do it when I was teaching I just was so buried into teaching right I cheated a little bit I got an idea I'd get up and write it down or whatever but when it came to my writing season uh, it pretty much had to start in May and end in the end of August 1st September right so um, I had a couple things out, and then I started writing these madrigals for middle school, and and they just kind of took off. And then, you know, I was with uh, two or three publishers, and you and I go back to the Warner Brothers days, and uh, and um, so I've just kind of kept doing it, and it, you know, kind of building these tunes a brick at a time, and my whole thing. I hope I'm answering your question, but my, my whole thing is I try to write choral music for younger voices, but also high school and, you know, what college, what you call junior high and bigger bodies um, that make them look and sound smart, you know, and, and don't have a huge learning curve to learn it. So when I'm writing for middle school boys voices i gotta think like that and not be giving them big leaps and jumps and you know kind of keep things. so that's how the whole writing thing happened and and um one further thing i never i never wrote for money um i wrote for necessity i i'd see or hear a not too good choral arrangement something that was out of range at a festival i was judging or working with and i go you know what there's a better one than that yeah and and, and when, when kids have to struggle for a long time just to get the notes, it's probably not the right piece for that particular group. Right. So okay. I tried to write music that was easily accessible and didn't take a whole lot of time to learn. Then they can make music for the rest of the year. So that's kind of my deal. Well, obviously, you've come at it from, the, from an educational standpoint first, um, but you obviously have written a lot of things that are very musical. Um, and like you talked about the madrigals and the, and the things that are, you know, transcriptions from other choral works that you've made more accessible for people. That's been, as I know, and, and you know, it's been highly successful and, and people appreciate that and need that. So that's, that's really cool. Um, so how, when did you, when did you actually get the first stuff published? Well, when I was at the university of Miami, um, we had summer choral camps. And so I think this was the first piece I had published. Um, I, I, I can't remember, but it was one of the first. 
Uh, and we had Larry Lappin, my good buddy at Miami. He did the high school jazz yeah. uh, section, but then there wasn't one for middle school because they, you know, they kind of thought they, they weren't old enough to do jazz. So I wrote a piece called How Old Do You Have to Be to Sing the Blues? And the hook line is, I think I'm old enough. And cool little piece. And it got published by um, Bernie Fisher uh, way back in the day. This must have been 1978, nine, something like that. Yeah. Well, that was probably the first piece. But then um, when Alfred published my, Sally Albrecht and I were doing summer workshops and I said, you know, I'd like to write something. I'm doing the Delaware Middle School Allstate next year. And I'd like to write something for them. Well, and that was 1992, three, something like that. And there was just a lot of trite stuff for middle school. There wasn't a lot of rich, you know, because it was too hard. It was written, the arrangements were too hard. Right. Overgeneralizing. I got people that got their truth too. This is the truth according to me. So, uh, <laughs> right. But, but, uh, but I wrote Sing Me Enchanted, the Morley Madrigal. Original five part made it three part, dedicated to Delaware Allstate. And the thing, and you know, after much consideration, the publisher said we'll publish it, and it, and it went off like a bullet. I mean, you know, it went. You know, I'm convinced that if things do well out of the shoot, they're probably going to have a shelf life. Other people are going to say, "Hey, I did this piece? Hey, how about this piece?" Or if it's on a festival, right? right. Uh, you know, I get a real kick out of doing these festivals i was doing them up until well i did not first week of march second week of march now everybody's shut down right but uh a real kick to have middle school or high school kids doing my music and like i said looking and sounded smart because the arrangement is something they can sing and sing well so but that was kind of the start and then from there you know uh, went to some th pieces of warner brothers and then and then uh, Carl Fisher and and um, and now Excelsis, Excelsior, excuse me. Yeah. Uh, so I've never been a one publisher guy. Our good friend Bob Dingley back in the at Warner Brothers days. Um, I talked to him about it. He said, "We'll we'll do an exclusive with you." And he says, "But I just don't think it's the right thing for you." Yeah. And I thought, well, here's the publisher telling me he would rather I wouldn't be exclusive. And he goes, because you've got different pieces that fit different publishers. Yeah. So, and I've never, you know, been interested in the publishing business on the other side. And I'm so happy for you that you're doing this because your reputation in the publishing business has always been great. Thank you. But, you know, and then the self-publishing thing, I mean, there's a lot of people doing that. I haven't got time for it. It takes me long enough to write a good arrangement, get it ready for a publisher, get it accepted and then move on and let them record it and sell it and publish it and, you know, advertise and that kind of thing. So, right. um, I'm happy just to, and I, and I, I don't write again. I, I, I don't set out to write an X amount of pieces, but I love writing because every once in a while I hear kids singing this and they sound pretty, pretty neat. So yeah. that's, that's the fun part when you hear your own music played, right? Exactly. And sang. So, so how do you get started? Is do you, do you find a lyric that you're interested in doing or a certain, well, I guess it depends if it's an arrangement or a original, but so just kind of tell us about your process. Yeah. Well, since I've, you know, been writing quite a bit, uh, I'm not saying quite a bit, you know, uh, some years it may be 10, 12 pieces, some years it may be 20. I don't set out to, write x number of pieces i've only got so many notes in me in a year my and my my writing season now starts a little earlier i mean march april maybe a little february but it always closes off in the middle of august my publisher deadlines are usually september 1 because they got to get in the studio they got to get this thing in print we got to get the proofs going so i don't want to be one of those writers that they're going into the studio and they're still working off the first draft Right. So I, I try to get everything done. My goal is August 20th because then I'm 10 days ahead of September 1 and my birthday is the 25th. So I want to be done and then be able to sit around and now that I've been retired for four years, but I've never been busier until the last couple of weeks. 
Uh, and then I write my ideas down. So at any given time, I've got three or four pages single space, two or three pages single space of ideas by category. Mm -hmm. And then from there, I something pops out, you know, and I go, yeah, this would be a good one. Uh, I don't have one of these. There's not a lot of one of these kind out there. I don't want to be in, I mean, there's certain things I won't write, like, like you, I'm sure, and others, because there's always already a great arrangement of it out there that I respect, you know? So I don't need to do that voicing of that arrangement. Um, and oh, then yeah. I, yeah. yeah. So, you know, the way I start, and I just did a little thing for somebody about this same topic, but I've got my grand piano downstairs. And I always start, I'm not a, I'm not, I'm, I'm not smart enough or got that much brain capability. I, and I know there's some writers, they go straight into to the software and start writing. I can't do it. I start at the grand piano downstairs uh, with a blank sheet of man, manuscript paper and a pencil and the idea or maybe a sketch, of, you know, like some PD sort of thing of the piece to write my arrangement. Right. And, and I just, I can, you know, this sounds kind of crazy, but it's the way I've been doing it forever. I can hear voices from my grand, I've got an electric piano back here that if it's the middle of the night, I don't want to wake my, wake my wife up. But the grand piano, especially a good grand piano, you can hear the voices when you're writing for voices with the overtones. Um, and then I go, I do sketches there that nobody could read but me. Mm -hmm. and, then I'm here and I start putting it in the software, finale in my case. And then I go back with that and the manuscript and go back and forth. It's not too far. I just go down the steps into the living room, come up the steps into my office and just wait. And, and, and I literally wait for it to come down. You know, I try not to press it. I think if you start pressing on it, like I got to get this done, bad things can happen. So um, that's my process. And then I, and then I, I never send it off until it's been done for a while, you know, and go back a day or two later and see, okay, you know, and try to self edit. Mm -hmm. One thing that drives editors crazy on your side is when things come up and come in and you got to, you got to have to do the first edit. I mean, there's stuff all over. So over the years, I've gotten a lot better at that. I know how things should be set up so that the publisher can look at it, hear it through an audio file or through the software, you know, and they've got everything there and then they can just listen to it and watch it and see if they like it. Right. So that's kind of my MO. So it sounds like you're not really a deadline kind of a composer. Well, <laughs> for us who were, well, go back to the Warner Brothers days, man, it was all about the deadline. <laughs> God, yeah. We'd have to come out of there with 25 assignments, you know. Oh, yeah. I, I always tell the story. I used to get, back in those days, I used to get a cassette tape. I remember uh -huh. distinctly there was one where I was actually going to the studio. I was, dry, I was getting ready to get in the car to drive to the airport. And they gave me a cassette tape and said, can you get this piece on the session? Well, I had to write it. I had to write it on the plane. Unbelievable. Like, yeah. Oh. Uh, but, uh, I'm deadline driven, you know, right now I'm, I'm kind of playing the cards in the deck, you know, and, uh, but when it gets to, gets to July, you know, and sometimes we go up to the mountains in July. So I cheat and I don't have a grand piano there, but I've got an 88 key I take with us. And, you know, I can feel the clock ticking, but if something's not ready, I'm not going to send it in, you know, I, and, and if, and if a publisher says, you know what, we like it, but we, we're full up on that particular style right now or that voicing or that, you know, right. Yeah, I go fine. I'm, I'm not, I have no problem with holding things off for another year because for me, at least it's done from what I did. And it, that doesn't happen that often. Right, right. Um, so, you know, and then you've always been kind of more exclusive guy with your publishers because you were working for them. 
Right. But, but, you know, I think those of us that work for, you know, write for several publishers, in my case, five or six, I think, if somebody doesn't want it, I don't take that as a rejection. It is an opportunity to take another look at it and send it to somebody else, see what they think. I mean, we've all had those that somebody rejected it and probably, and maybe for good reason, took that advice, did something with it, send it to somebody else and the thing, you know, gets on Pepper's editor's choice and does a good job. So, uh, you know, I will say that to beginning writers. I will, and, and you were back there in the Warner Brothers days. I think you were there when Tina was there and all those people and Gwen and. Uh, Gwen, yeah, and Brian Bush, yeah. Brian Bush, yeah. Mm -hmm. But I, um, mm. I'll never forget, you know, I, I would just, I'd, I'd send in stuff that I knew they had the copyright on. Right. And I'd send it like a, like a Ger Gershwin or a Mancini or a Cole Porter or something that they, I knew they had the print rights. And then it wasn't good. Yeah, no, 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 no. And then all of a sudden, they got the Mancini Library. You maybe remember that. Yeah. And and a person in the office, I don't know, you know, where, where this is going to go, so I don't want to get anybody in trouble. Uh, <laughs> a person in the office says, we need a Days and Wine and Roses a cappella. Can you do it? And I said, yeah, I'll get it done for Because I wasn't doing that much, you know. I was doing some stuff with Alfred and so on. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I said, yeah. And I said, I'll get it to you in uh, a week and a half. And so I was doing a festival uh, thing at TCU in Fort Worth. Took the sketch with me, worked on it when I wasn't doing something. And I had it done, and they, and they loved it. And so, because I love all, writing all sorts of stuff. I love writing a cappella ballads and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, whatever classics and and every once in a while original pieces. Well, that certainly uh, keeps it fresh. Just do a lot of things that are different variety. So yeah. you talked a little bit about you know young. What I wanted to say, Larry, on that. Yeah. Okay, for, you know I'm getting old. So, but that <laughs> but I, I, if I'm looking at young writers or new writers, yeah, you know first of all submit to where you think it will work. And in some right. cases, these are closed shops because there's places that have eight, six coral writers on payroll. You know, they got to get those people's stuff out first. But when you, if you get a rejection, don't look at it as a personal rejection. Look at it, at it as, a, as a learning opportunity because we've all been rejected. Oh, absolutely. And, and, uh, and that's not, you know, it's like try, try again, you know. Pick up, look at the piece, say what they see. What they said. <clears throat> there's only been there's been a few cases where I just didn't agree with it. Sure. Uh, you know, like this is not appropriate for middle school or whatever. I, and I wanted to say, you know what? I know what's what appropriate for middle school. I've taught middle school. I put out a lot of stuff. Right. And you know, they're not going to do six part with baritone one and baritone two and bass. They're not. It's not going to work. No. No. But. You know, but that's their opinion, my opinion. But rejection is not a bad thing. Acceptance is a lot better, but, you know, it's an opportunity for growth. Well, also, uh, what I tell young composers is that um, it may not, it just may not fit the style that that company is looking for. And then uh -huh. also is the company, as you know, is a reflection of the person who's actually picking the music. Right. You know, because they have to rely on their personal tastes, their opinions, their sense of the market. Um, so if they say no, it may mean, like you said, you, you've had pieces that were rejected, but then go on to be, you know, big sellers with other publishers. So right. I, I, I've, I've said no to pieces before that have, you know, gone on to be on, you know, Texas, uh, UIL lists and stuff like that. And I'm, and I, of course I'm like, ah, you know, but you, you, you win some, you lose some, you, 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 you have to go with, I always say you have to go with your personal musical taste because that's the only ones mm -hmm. you have. Yeah, that's what I say. It's, you know, it's the truth according to me, and everybody's got their own truth. And, and uh, but it's, you know, it, it can also be, like you said, you've already filled, publishers already filled that slot. Right, right. We can't accept it because we've already got it filled. And then that happens too. But I think the main thing for me is <clears throat> feeling really good about what I've written. Yeah. You know, if, if you're just writing, you know, to see what the royalty check's going to be, 
you're going to have dis huge disappointments. Totally. You got to write where you feel like this is really contributing mm -hmm. to the choral art, in my case, at this level, or at this level, or at this level, in this style. And, um, and I, I, I feel real good about what I've done. But you know, there's still, there's still more to be done, I think. I'm not, I'm not laying it down yet. <laughs> That's good. We're, we're glad for that. So mm -hmm. since, since you do a lot of uh, honor groups and um, a lot of guest conducting and stuff like that, what might be helpful is because, of, of course, this probably will be played for probably composition students, but also for students in choirs. What kind of things could you maybe give to them from your perspective as a composer and a conductor that you see that students need to do a better job of, and, and teachers for that matter, too? Yeah, well, I think the one thing, um, I see a lot of choirs when I do these festivals. Right. And, uh, and I really don't have to do them anymore. You know, a matter of fact, my wife and I had a conversation about seven, six or seven, eight years ago. And, she, and I said, you know what, I, I don't really have to do these. You know, it's not about the money at all. It's, and she goes, well, I think you should do a few. And I go, you, you just want me to be gone or what? And she goes, no. She said, it's, you come back with so many ideas. But I see a lot. Of, so the advice is for the, for the director is to make sure you've got music that the choir you've got in front of you has the ability yeah. and the time to do. Yeah. You know, just because you heard six college choirs go through this incredible piece does not mean it's right for your high school choir. Right. And, and because you heard a middle school choir at the National ACDA do this, this, and this, it may not be r the right piece for your choir. So I always say, you know, complicated does not, or difficult to complicated does not mean it's good. And simple does not mean it's bad. Good music, good music. So the number one thing would be program good music that your choir can sing. And then if it's a concert or if it's a festival, don't do the same, same, same. You know, mm -hmm. if you're getting three shots on a festival, you know, have for, I'm just going to take, for example, for a middle school concert choir, you know, do a, you know, do a classical piece, do a spiritual, and maybe do an original piece by somebody to close it out. You know, don't do three madrigals, you know, don't do the hit from Beauty and the Beast for a concert choir competition. I mean, I've seen bizarre things. Right. And I think the main thing is um, doing things that are quality that your students have the ability to do in a reasonable amount of time. You know, there's, there's pieces you're going to have to work on half a semester for them to get it, but there also ought to be pieces they can get in a couple rehearsals. Right. Um, and, and you're still working on technique and tone and, and vowels and text accents and syllabic stress and all that stuff that makes it go from good to great. Right. So. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, selecting literature is, I always tell teachers is the most important thing you do because that's your curriculum. Right. That's your textbook. Right. So, so talk to me a little bit about some, uh, other composers that might've been your influences along the way that kind of were you know, you were trying to emulate maybe as, as a composer along the way. I know. Well, a thousand, uh, right? you know, I really consider myself probably 75 to 80% an arranger and the other percent a composer. You know, I don't, I don't sit at the piano that much saying, okay, I'm going to write a brand new piece today mm -hmm. with brand new lyrics. So some, if in my, in my compositions, um, uh, I've got to have a good text. Sometimes I write a text, but as far as arrangers that have influenced me, uh, you know, the, the Shaw Parker stuff, that has been in the Lawson Gould cat, uh, catalogs, regardless of who has got the print rights on that, that kind of bounces back. But those things are timeless. Mm -hmm. And I remember yeah. when we recorded them, 
we re-recorded all the Lost and Gould. I remember that, yeah. And it was so rich, and it was not e- it was not tough music, you know. So, you know, to write like somebody like uh, Alice Parker um, is is great, you know. And there's 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 a lot of great writers. I mean, Marilyn Lightfoot's one of my perhaps lifelong friends, and the way she writes for middle school <clears throat> has been terrific. I don't know that she's right if she's writing that much anymore now that she's retired from. Uh, publishing, but, you know, I'd look at those and I've used them on festivals. I'd look at the, if I was doing a middle school festival, you're not going to do nine Robinson pieces. You know, matter of fact, right. Uh, somebody said zero is not enough and two is too many, but maybe one's not enough and two, three is too many. I don't know, but you're not. So you have to depend on other writers and there's, I'm not, I'm not clicking with who they are, but, um, and the other thing I do when I'm doing festivals and listening to nine, 10 groups a day is I'm writing down really good stuff from other people that I can use on a festival. So um, there's a lot of good writers out there and a lot of good writers with a number of publishers. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But <clears throat> I think sometimes you can get past, you know, there, there are some writers that write so much. I don't know how they do it. I don't know how they, you know, they, you know, we're talking 30, 40 tunes. And I'm like, you know, I run out of notes, you know, and they start sounding the same. I don't want any of my pieces to sound the same. Right. And, and there's probably some things in my writing that people go, oh yeah, that's a Robinson piece because blah, blah, blah. Right. Uh, I don't want to be sitting there going, oh gosh, I've got to finish 10 more pieces. You know, I just write the pieces I want to write and hope they get published and hope people sing them. So what would be like the one big, huge piece of advice you'd give to that young composer who's think, thinking about, you know, trying to get music published or, you know, wants to get their music out there? What, what's, what's, the, what's the real nugget? Well, I, I do think there's a, there's a, place for I sat on a composer panel about I think it was the last year I was at the university so it must have been 2015 2016 the Society for Composers International which is this huge thing with classical or contemporary writers most of which are employed by universities and we can re- decide why that is too but right. uh, you know most of them were composition people some big names and mm-hmm. and uh, uh and they had me be on the panel because the guy that was running says, you know, you got more pieces published than anybody that's on our panel. So the main, it came to, they were, they were trying to kind of corner me a little bit like, you know, are, are you writing for musical expression and freedom or are you writing for money? And I said, no, I write out of necessity. I want to write things that is going to sound, are going to sound good with whoever that age group is and whatever that choir is that I'm writing for. Right. Right. So, um, if you write really tough music, <laughs> in the words of Sandy Feldstein, <laughs> our good friend and mentor, got to miss Sandy. But, you know, you got to realize the more difficult it is, if you're writing school music, the more difficult it is, the less audience you're going to have, the less people are going to be able to do it. Right. And you respect those writers that are pushing the envelope and, but pushing the envelope in a way that people can still sing it. Yeah. Uh, but I would look, if, if I was starting over and I didn't have this opportunity when I started, because we didn't have the internet and we didn't have, you know, J.W. Pepper and we didn't have, I mean, online and we didn't have all the access. I mean, oh yeah, people have it made right now. Oh yeah. It's crazy. I think if I was going to give a trade secret on this about, you know, young writers want to do it. If you want to write for middle school, I'd go to J.W. Pepper and see what they've got for middle school. And then see what they've got that's editor's choice. Not that that means it's the greatest piece in the world, but it does mean that a panel of people thought it was pretty good. Good, right. And I would go to, you know, the voicings. In middle school, it's probably going to be three-part mixed, or it's going to be S.A.B. Right. Or if you want to write a women's piece, plug in SSA or SSAA. If you want to write an elementary piece, plug in SA or two-part. See what other people are doing. 
and and then decide whether you want to do original stuff uh which i i don't i don't think i would ever want to do all original stuff i still think there's enough classics out there classics both in texts and in literature you know from the renaissance on forward uh that can be arranged for the voicings you want it to do right you know right. and in some cases there's instrumental music that has everything but text, you know, right. public domain instrumental music, you know, from Mozart on up or, or before that you could take that beautiful melody and make a choral piece out of it. And you know what? It's public domain. You're, you can't just go out and arrange Misty, you know, it's, it's, it's still under copyright. If you're with a company that can do that or somebody wants to pay enough for, for the rights and most of the time they don't No, you know there's enough for, there's enough of those arrangements that have been done mm -hmm. every once in a while somebody will come to me and say can you do this and i'll say yeah i'll give it a shot but you know don't have your head in the sand and it will really help your writing when you see what other people are doing and you go wow that's a really good piece why why is that a good piece? Why do the guys, even if they're studio singers, why do those guys singing in a six note range for middle school, why do they sound so, why does this sound like a real choir? You know, that's not monotonic out there. They're, it's interesting to sing that third part or that baritone part, right? you know, which is sometimes relegated to last. Whatever notes left, that's what we give it to them. You know, so they're jumping all over the, the trampoline trying to sing this thing. So. Right. Right. But I don't know. I, I'm happy to give advice to anybody, but problem with that is sometimes they take it, you know. Um, but I think that's a pretty, in today's world, you got everything at your access. Sure. You, know, you probably go to YouTube and just put in middle school choir. You're probably going to have 500 YouTubes that it's X, X middle school choir. Y middle school choir. And listen to what they're doing. If they sound good, look into that and say, wow, that's a great beat. How could I do something like that? Looking at other people's music is the best way to go uh, see what works. And then in your mind go, well, why? Well, maybe it's the way it's yeah. scored, whatever it might be. It, it works. So just trying to make that happen. So how about share with us your ultimate musical moment where you maybe got to work with the, the certain kind of choir or a certain musical personality or you know, just a, a story about, you know, what was one of the highlights of, of your, your career? Well, one I know of there's highlights. probably a lot, but. Well, one of my, I, I'm thinking about three weeks ago before, this was actually the first Tuesday in March before all this hit the second week or third week in March. But I had the chance for the second time to hear Renee Clausen's Concordia Choir here in Gainesville. And the next night they were singing at ACDA in Mobile. And you talk about a person I admire, um, not only in his writing, but his conducting. And, but that's, that's as an observer. So as a participant, uh, probably highlights have been, I did, um, when was it? 2012? I did uh, Schubert Mass in G with uh, professional soloists and orchestra and about 300 voices at Lincoln Center. Wow. And, pre and premiered my De Profundis. Um, which is in the Lawson Gould catalog. And our good friend, Carl Stroman wrote the orchestra part for it. And, uh, and then I went back two years later and did Mozart's Solemn Vespers. And the, and the producer happened to say, we want you to close with that same piece. It's a hit. It's a great closer. You know, it's, it's like five minutes. I mean, it's not, but I'm not going to make a concert out of it. And then last year, uh, May of 2019, um, I had gotten a call from one of the producers in New York. I'd never worked for him before. It was DCINY, and I've worked for other ones. And uh, they mainly do choral and choral orchestral stuff. And they had talked to me two years before that about doing a concert of my music with middle school, because not too many people do middle school at Carnegie Hall. I mean, a few. Right. And not, especially not do one composer's deal, but that was their request. They said, we know you got a lot of different kinds of middle school choir pieces and, and you got a lot of pieces out. I think I'm at over, over 500, like 520. I don't, I don't know. 
I hadn't counted them in a long time. And about two years ago, I had to write a something for somebody and and I still had over 300 in my bio. And my wife said, have, have you counted these lately? <laughs> up. Anyway, but so they threw out the net and um, the advertising. They said, well, we got to have to, you know, 200 to make it work with the numbers. It was just piano and choirs. So they called me in April 2018. They said, we got a problem. We got 350 people signed up and we only have room for 200 on stage at a time. So you're going to do two choirs back to back. And that was a kick. It was a lot of work. I don't know. You know, it makes you kind of think, have I still got the energy to do this? You know, I had I did then. I might have another one in me, but it was a real highlight because I made sure that each choir had the same style of piece in the same program, only it was a different title. Right. So start with the madrigal, go to a classical, go to a soprano alto piece, go to a TB piece, go to a, um, an African piece, go to um, uh, a jazz piece, and then a closer and an original closer. And... Uh, so that was really that was really a kick, and you know, and and we go back. I mean, you know, working with people like you know Bob Dingley and Sandy Feldstein, and and uh, you know, getting to meet and re meet and record Dave Brubeck's music. I mean, yes. that was that was a true highlight. It's, I've had a good ride, and I'm not done yet. So no, um, that's why it's really why I retired in 2016 from the university. It was 32 years. And I was able to retire uh, financially even before that. And I just said, you know what? I'd rather go out here rather than, you know. And I've seen a lot of my colleagues do that for whatever reason. And, and, and some of them, it's, it's because it's their whole life. Their whole life is that. And they can't, uh, you know, my buddy Charles Hoffer, who was my mentor for, Oh, yeah. He was my, my boss for 10 years, and I was his boss for 20, one of my soulmates. I, I spoke the eulogy at his, at his funeral. Uh, he, re, he retired, I think, at 80, 81 and, and, died, and died at 83. But he, I remember for about six, eight, 10 years before that, he says, Russ, I just don't know what I'd do if I didn't go to the university and teach. I said, you know what, Charles? If anybody deserves it, you teach as long as you want to. And, you know, luckily he was there with me and, uh, until my last two years. But I've, I've, I've felt very good about when I walked out. It takes a while to get, you know, used to not going into the office and teaching students. And I miss, I miss teaching students a little bit. Uh, I try to get opportunities to do that other ways. But every day at the university and no more faculty meetings and you know, no more curriculum revisions and all that good okay. stuff. But anyway. It was a good well, ride. Well, so so that that leads to my next question, which was, you know, what what kind of things that uh, you what kind of things you do outside of music that uh, people might not know, like hobbies or things, yeah, like, places you like go, uh, whatever. Yeah, well, Brendan and I've had um, uh, a lot of opportunity to travel for fun. It's kind of nice to just do things for fun. And, you know, so, you know, last year we went out to Tahoe and we went to Germany on a Rhine cruise with South America in January. And uh, so we like to travel uh, right now. We don't see any travel in the foreseeable future, but I think, you know, give it to me. No. Um, I also like to fish a little bit. I've got a place. Uh, I don't have a place, but I got a place that I go rent and uh, I don't want to own anything really uh, like that. Uh, I found it's much more financially feasible to go rent something and walk away from it, uh, which is what we do up in the mountains. But um, so that, and then I've got, uh, I've got a little recording studio here in my office and I've got, you know, I've got the ProSona stuff, but I'm really not into it. I've got the software, but I've got a, uh, Fostex uh, 16 channel digital uh, 16 track and and so I'm I guess this fall I made one um, I get I make I make uh, albums CDs for my family 
uh, and very close friends because these are kind of intimate things, but it's it's really fun to do like a Christmas album and you know play piano and guitar and the bass and I've got an electric electronic drum, drum set over in the uh, another bedroom. I take the once I get everything done, that's what I did this last time. I take it over there and put all the drum tracks on because I know how to play drums too because I taught drums and I you know I taught sax but I don't play sax but I'm an old trumpet player that was my that was my scholarship uh, instrument and so I got a trumpet and a valve trombone about nine guitars everything from classical to uh, you know I've got a hummingbird and I've got a martin and you know I got uh, bass guitar 12 strings so I can I can play with my toys and so <laughs> right. that was also my wife's suggestion. It was like when I finished my writing season last fall for 2020, Brenda said, I think it's time for you to go to your studio and make a new album. <laughs> and so I do that. And it's fun. You know, people get a kick out of it. It's not perfect, but it's, you know, you can do some pretty, I still like working the faders and the effects, you know, and the punch in, punch out. And I'm not going to make a living at it. It's just for fun. So that's kind of what I do for fun. That's awesome. Well, any, any final words before we wrap this up about uh, any, anything, anything in particular, composition, choral music, whatever, whatever? Well, I'd say maintain your friendships. You know, it's a small world, the publishing world. I don't care how many publishers there are that are doing educational choral music or band music or whatever. It's a small world. Uh, everybody knows everybody and pretty much knows everything everybody's doing in a way. And keep your friendships. You know, I've got friendships that go back, and yours is one I treasure. We go back a long time. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm thinking 25 years now, Larry. Something uh, like that. I was at Warner in '95, so yeah. 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 And um, and you know, and keep keep having people you can ask for advice, um, mm. or you know, well, here's a piece. What do you think about it? and and whether you're a starting off writer, you know, you've got mentors. Really get your mentors going. You know, if, if you're in college, you know, and you want to get published, you know, talk to those theory composition made teachers and, you know, all that stuff folds in. You know, I thought part writing and parallel fifths and, you know, all that, you know, and all those transpositions and all that, but it all comes together. Right. You know, it's... Um, I mean, there's there's some of it, you know, the French, Italian, German sixth. I haven't thought about those in a while, but, <laughs> <laughs> but and the other thing is, trust your ears. You know, your your ears are everything when you're writing, and if you hear something that's not quite right, don't try to shoehorn it in there. Right. You know, it's got it's got to be. I, I always think that a, that an audience. And I, I have a lot of colleagues that would tell me that's not true. But I always think that an audience ought to be able to hear something one time and be, and be captured by it and be taken by it. Right. You know, if it's, if it's just too old here, you know, if it's going to take 10 times to hear it before you even start to understand it, it doesn't work for me. Right. And so, you know, technical stuff can still, I mean, I've seen some really, heard some really great things were highly technical, but the, but the audience could get it the first time. So if you're writing for an audience, and I think everybody is, you're writing for a group, but you're also writing for how is that group going to communicate this to an audience in a quality way? Because to me, I say this quite a bit, there's only two ways I know people learn in choral music, by what I see and what I hear. There's no other, there's no other assessment. You know, if they walk on stage like, man, we are on it. We are happy to be here. We, we know what posture is. We know how we're supposed to stand. Before they open their mouth, they've been impressive. Right. And then they sing an impressive performance of a piece that they can do and that the audience can understand it doesn't get any better now. So those are the things I still think about a lot. Well, Russ, thanks for taking the time to uh, talk to us today and 
helping teachers out with uh, some distance learning things that they can use. We, we certainly appreciate it. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Have fun. It's a All good right. ride. All right. Take care. Thanks again care. for listening. And this is uh, Larry Clark again from Excelsior Music Publishing.